Okay, I'm going to talk today about the history of remote working or location independent. And a lot of you want to say digital nomads, but that, that's really kind of an irritating word for me because I probably am a digital nomad and most people are not digital nomads. Okay, I'm Andy Lee Graham. I've traveled nonstop for, I've lived in a 114 countries in 25 years of nonstop travel. I have no home, okay? So I've been a remote worker. I had a uh, website uh, that I created that worked and funded me for 23 years. I just closed it. And it uh, was completely created remotely, okay? Everything about it was done by remote workers, okay? And uh, location independent, digital nomad, any of these different words, uh, they all, what it means is I, the business is the website and I work from 114 countries on it. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about the history of working remotely. When I first started traveling, I went to, um, because this is, explains to you how to do it. There's never been a time where you could work, like have a job inside the United States and live in another country. Um, I always think about this architect in India. He, he pretended that he had a business in Texas and he did house design drawings and he had it so that he worked always in India and all these Indian workers were things. So he, for, for years, he pretended that he actually had a business in Texas. The mailing address was there. He paid by check, uh, everything. He answered the phone like he was in Texas, but he was really in India. Okay. Uh, not very honest guy, right? But he he uh, definitely made money because he used the freelancers or the people that he had in his stable that he controlled on the ground while living in India. But I have um, had workers, freelancers from all around the planet. I had one person that worked for me for almost 20 years named Andrew. Um, good man. Um, but... How did it start? I started by going to Acapulco. And when I first started this, it was very difficult to, we had some, a few internet cafes. There was one in Acapulco, but there wasn't one in Pia de Cuesta where I was staying. So what I have to do is go once a week. I was writing a newsletter at this time and go once a week and I'd upload, download. Well, that wasn't true. I did. Yeah, I uploaded, download. I'd connect my computer to the internet cafe in uh, Acapulco. It was about eight miles uh, north of Piedra de Cuesta, where I stayed for almost off and on for a year. I stayed in Tosco, Mexico, Mexico City, all different cities, and I even flew back to the United States once or twice. Um, but the, generally, I had a computer. I always had a laptop. I've always carried a laptop. Um, never... At that time, we didn't have smartphones. And um, the way it worked would be I would connect. Uh, I could connect to, through a modem to, I, I connected sometimes to United States, but I also connected with the modem to uh, um, thing. I, I would pretty much buy an internet connection for 30 days. And then I would uh, try to buy, by different ways, I would get a phone line. Now, everybody had a phone line then, okay? And I get a phone line and I would upload, download emails. Um, I used a thing called Fox Mail. Somewhere along the line, see, you had somewhere along the line, Hotmail started. And then I had a thing called USA.net where they promised me an internet, <laughs> a free internet connection for life. And I could download, uh, upload with this POP, P O P. SM, simple mail transfer protocol. And that's really, everything was communication then. Everything was about emails and newsletters because newsletters were real popular because you could download and upload them. And you, the cost of a connection was quite expensive, okay? Everything's so cheap now, it's ridiculous. And I did that, I when I first started, I, I sent out an email um, to about 50, then it grew up to about 150 people I sent out it. A weekly email. Then I went to a newsletter server where 
I don't know, it was like Topica or something like that. Somewhere along the line, I had Google Groups and Yahoo. They all were offering these free email services. But uh, generally, um, it was a lot more lenient than on spam. They didn't have spam. And um, it was just becoming kind of a topic. Uh, right now, nobody talks about spam. There was about 10 years into it. When I started traveling in 1998 or something like that, 25 years ago, I slowly, I was in Mexico, I would go to Tosco and I would go into internet cafes and I had these little three and a half inch floppy disk and I, I had a camera, the first camera was really horrible, cost about $500, but it, it saved everything, I think on the camera, then I had to download it, really horrible quality, okay, but uh, then I bought a Mavic about two or three years in, which was a $700 camera, it had these three and a half inch floppy disk and each, each photo is about 25 megs, and then I would put it in, and I, I could, every, every computer had a little three and a half inch floppy disk, right? And uh, what was interesting, though, is I'd walk into an internet cafe, and I'd stick my three and a half inch floppy disk in there, and it had a uh, fox mail on it, and I would run the program right from the computer. I mean, right from the three and a half inch floppy disk. Not really floppy because it had a hard shell. <laughs> okay, I never actually used the bigger ones. I, I did when I had a, I don't know, one of them Apple computers, um, which I never really, was really kind of a waste of time. But um, what happened is time went on, everything kept unloading. For the first probably year, probably almost until 2000, for the first two years, um, I worked always out of an internet cafe. That means I'd go in an internet cafe and I either took a um, three and a half inch floppy and ran it from the disk. Somewhere along the line, I don't know, maybe 2000, 2001, 2003, they came out with these um, USB chips, right? And the USB chip were, you know, they were funny. They're like 25 megs, right? No, 25 gigs. Oh, yeah, well, who knows about it? But I started running a program from them also. And the other side is the only way to make a phone call at this way, this time was a voice over IP system where you would walk into uh, an internet, internet cafe and it had these little booths and you could make a phone call. So it was really kind of funny because the, the remote working at that time wasn't anything like what it is where right now you can use WhatsApp or, you know, you know. Facebook Messenger, Signal, or Viber, or Telegram, or all these different communication systems. Skype. Skype came into, um, I started using Skype, uh, let's see, like voice over IP. I think when they first started, they just had voice over, it was like Skype to Skype, and I could communicate Skype to Skype. And that didn't really work very good, because you always had to get somebody to sign up on Skype on the other side. Eventually, Skype added a Skype telephone number, and I was able to have a phone number. That was really nice. Somewhere in this juncture, PayPal started happening. I was in business before Facebook and Yahoo, okay? And what happened is PayPal was a windfall because then I could start making money, okay? That means that somebody could send me money. So PayPal... I always remember calling up this friend of mine, the stockbroker, he said, Keith, I said, PayPal, 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 <laughs> because it was quite obvious to me that you could make a, this was the turning point for um, remote workers, because before that, we didn't really have any way to make any money. We didn't have any way to process and take money that was trusted. You kept trying to start, I kept trying to have one of these, uh, you know, credit card processing thing, but yeah, you really needed to be in the United States, have a bank account, have a business, and have a business address, brick and mortar place, and I didn't have any of that stuff. And so for the first few years, what I did mostly is I would trade a kind of internet page for a free room, okay? And uh, somewhere, um, then somewhere for the first couple years, people started donating money, and I was, they were really generous. They were giving me about $300 a month, and I was living in $5 and $10 a month, uh, $10 a 
day rooms, but I also lived for about, say, two or three weeks at each hotel where I would create, take a bunch of photos and make a website. I, I put them on a general website that I owned because nobody at that time had Facebook and nobody had a website. And they, these pages get a lot of traffic, okay? And I would, I would show them show up five page wonder i call them five page wonders is like you know accommodations rooms you know the location and it's like a brochure online and i i did this for a couple of years and it was really easy to get a trade because everybody thought of this as a cutting edge thing and it was really easy to make pages this was mostly done in i guess i use a front page a program called front page it was really a very good program because it could create a form. A form is a complicated thing on a website. And uh, I lived and then I was getting donations for about uh, $300 a month. Somewhere along the line, Forbes.com made me one of the top five travel bloggers. And then I never got another don donation. It was like they almost put me out of business. I should have never told any of my... Uh, newsletter readers that I got for because they they assumed that with this fame that I made my <laughs> I almost went broke somewhere along yes, everything was funny but I made a consolidator uh, air consolidator website and uh, I made some money for that for about a year somewhere oh, about three or four or five years into it I, I was I went I after I did all of Central and South America really living cheap I mean, less than $400 a month. Uh, the, the secret to being a remote worker, a digital nomad, is to keep the overhead low. And I was living, like I lived in, I don't know, Ecuador on 50 cents a day for the hotel because they had a crash of the Sucre. And, um, but I worked my way slowly, thinking I, I would uh, do different things. I guess I tried to teach English one time in Arrowkeeper, Peru, which was really just barely making enough money to uh, pay my daily rent. Um, like I said, Forbes.com making me the top, top five travel blogger on, in Forbes, whatever that means. I guess I would say the world, but it didn't matter. I, I started getting a top travel blogger. Was it travel blogger or travel newsletter? See, if I wrote about... 200 newsletters before they started out with the blog and I guess in 2003 I do know that date when I went to Iraq they started the blog um, so I was bumbling back and forth and somewhere I was in Thailand and they started Google AdSense and I made five dollars the first day that I had the website up a guy named Steve Noten, which is an SEO person. He worked for TripAdvisor. He was very, very good. He, he showed me it. He paid me $75 a month to advertise on my website because that um, I had like, I don't know, 70,000 pages. But uh, yeah, I, I had guess went all the way from, 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 uh, like there, there became a point, maybe about the time I made it to Panama, where where Yahoo, I think, started. Yahoo was an online-only system, and it was free, right? And you could only read your emails. You could, at that point, do a, a pop email. You could upload a download on Yahoo. And uh, I would still upload download because the time it would take to upload download on my emails was a lot cheaper and it was about five dollars an hour no yeah five dollars an hour to use the internet in an internet cafe and that was that way for years and so you only went in there and spent five dollars or three dollars or whatever you did and then you upload download your email onto your floppies and then we went into usbs i don't know exactly when usb started but uh, when i got all the way to chile and came up through uh air you know Argentina, somewhere through there, it became nebulous, but I flew to Europe and then I flew to Thailand. And when I got to Thailand is when Google AdSense made me a rich man. Okay. So I went from having almost nothing to, for about eight years earning, I don't know, Google AdSense was like a windfall. 
Okay. And I had different ways of making money, whether it was trading pages, right? I made this air consolidation website that was pretty good. Made me money for a couple of years, maybe 200, 300 a month. But uh, I did mostly I was doing trades thing and I was scrambling every possible way. Um, in 2000, when I was in Panama is when I started um, hobotraveler.com. And um, I started that under the idea that it was perfect website for me. On hindsight, I, I had a traveler that I didn't get it that day. And if I would have had a traveler, I would have probably made, instead of having hobo traveler, I would have made uh, thousands more because the word hobo caused a lot of trouble. It always caused trouble. It was a perfect, literally it was the perfect page, except because I was work, I was spending my whole time looking for a, how to earn money. So a hobo was a person who went from place to place, but the, the, the people were so, you know, they, they were so, how do you explain it? People are very, very simple, okay? The, the minute they heard, they heard the word hobo, they said, I'm not a hobo, okay? And it caused a lot of problems. And uh, I wish I would have got the, uh, the website, A Traveler, it was available on one day on January 1st, 2000, it was available on January 2nd, it wasn't available. And I took Hobo and I thought it was the perfect site because it was fun, but uh, it did supply me with money for 20, 20 some years, probably 21 years up until COVID started. But when I connected, I was very good at SEO. And when I connected up the ad sets, I got up to the point where I was making about $2,000, $3,000 a month. This is when AdSense would pay you about 25 cents a click. And then they kept lowering it as Google became a bigger and bigger. I was with Google before they became a initial public offering. And uh, I, I appreciate Google in a sense before they became a publicly traded company, they were really a nice company. The people that started it would send, my, send a gift to my house every year on Christmas. My mom would always get it. And for about five to eight years, I was really making a lot of money. So what happens with remote working, okay, the ideal worker in a way gets a job inside the United States and then go, goes work someplace else. And he has a low cost of living, but think I was different. I made all my money for 20 some years from the internet. And I'm still making money from the internet. So I'm one of the few people on the planet that actually has always earned money because of his SEO skills, search engine optimization skills. I was able to have enough traffic to pay me. And right now we're, we have Patreon and I'm, I'm still making money pretty much from the content that I give the website. Now content used to be king, it used to be the more content you had on a website, the better it was because of search. Now you're in a, you're in one of the world's biggest likes at any website, no matter how many pages it got, has this being shared by billions of pages, right? And so to get any kind of traffic um, anymore, it's almost a joke on search engine optimization. That's really almost a nothing. The reason why TikTok and shorts are doing good is because the attention span is really short. I don't like to do... Uh, Shorts, I, I erased them off, uh, all, all of them off of uh, my Andy Lee Graham thing because it, it, it attracts a, a person that doesn't have an attention span. So everything's about getting, being a guru. When, uh, he, what is it, HTML goodies. Oh man, what an old website. That guy was good. We, I used to always hand code everything for the first, I don't know. I would do a combination of front page and hand coding for years, okay, years. And I still get in and play with the code because a lot of times there's a lot of conflicts. But I I don't have a website anymore. Well, I guess I did just put up Andy Lee Graham, which, which was a place to put all my, uh, is a place to hold all my 15,000 blog posts. And the goal is to get a readership, a steady stream of people. And had a new, we had a newsletter for years and years and years. 
On the other side is, say about five years ago, today's 2024, five or eight years ago, people stopped reading their emails. <laughs> this was kind of amazing. Nobody read, reads their emails anymore, and they went to more to like Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or Signal as a way to communicate, or just inside the United States, they still do text messages over the phone. Over the you know, cell phone tower, data, phones. But uh, the way to make money as a digital nomad or location independent, for about eight years, I probably sold products on Amazon. I made a lot of money, about 1000 thousand to thousand five hundred a month until I got blocked because I, I accessed by accident Amazon in India and Amazon would had this round robin thing. I I never could prove to them that I was actually the Andy Graham, right? And they, they took all my products offline, but in a way they were competing with me because the minute that I would put up a product, they would go into competition with Another product, they'd go into competition. They had these companies that they own in China that, uh, that they're, they're not reputable. What they do is they use their website to figure out which products are selling, and then they got companies that are like uh, interlocking directors that uh, would do it. So, I, I mean, I was selling so many secret pockets, I couldn't even possibly keep them in stock. And then one year later, China was competing with the exact almost same, same pocket at half the price. And then they would go, what they would do is they would show my secret pockets, but they would always be showing the, the half price ones in China. Really common knowledge that uh, what um, Amazon does is they try to figure out what, what products are sellable and then they, they produce them themselves and compete against the seller on Amazon. Um, branding is tough. But I had about 20 products and I did really good. And I had them made in, uh, had some Amish women making these products. And they would package them up, and I put them fulfillment by Amazon, which was a good thing. Um, on the other side is Amazon. Uh, I don't know. Like I, I designed this vest, and I sold it, and I was doing real good until I think they wanted to get rid of me because they they left the products up to bring in the advertisement. I was sending all this traffic, all these videos, all this thanks to Amazon and I couldn't sell it and they used my my tickle system to send it. So I could talk forever. I mean like Google groups and Yahoo groups and all these email systems, newsletters. In a way, Amazon gives you like, I was laughing because I was really kind of frustrated. Amazon gives you a real cheap newsletter system. It's like $10 a month, but they get to know exactly who's using the internet and it's, it's really just a data collection system. They make the NSA look like uh, nitwits, okay? But I made a lot of money and I probably had about eight different computers, uh, laptops. They used to be quite heavy. They used to be thick like that. And uh, right now I have two computers and five smartphones and one Kindle. I have an Apple phone because we used to have an Apple app and. I, a friend, a, a man, a, a member of the website sent me that. I really appreciated that. Uh, on the other side is how do I do business right now? I, I went from YouTube has never been a good business. Okay, <laughs> anything to do with the internet as is a up and down business, is a roller coaster. I went out of business. Uh, SEO is kind of a joke anymore. Search engine optimization is a joke. Even search engine optimization, I don't think. You're in a lake that's expanding, almost doubling every month, right? And uh, the competition. So Google likes this because they then try to get you to buy your traffic, okay? And if you have a product that's more than $100 a month, $200 a month, and you're selling it, yeah, you can buy traffic. We, were, we had on our... Our membership, we only had a $25 a month membership, and it wasn't enough money to be made to buy traffic. So you really need to have a monetization of about thing, or you have to be totally corrupted, make people click on things the wrong way, right? And most people, 80% of uh, internet, 
people working here are just sociopaths, okay? I would say that most techs are sociopaths. They really just don't care about anybody but the money. Um, and I always cared about my clients and my people and whatever. And I shut down the website because hobotraveler.com or Everyday Hobo because I realized that uh, social networks monetize anger. I, you see it all the time. There's fights on X or Twitter right now. In so, Facebook monetizes anger and they monetize sex and they monetize relationships that are dysfunctional. And I don't, I will not be part of that. Um, but the history of this is interesting. And if you want to make money, you have to, um, I was talking to a guy yesterday and he said he wanted to go, he had, he has like a real expensive medical problem. And then he says, what, but I'm okay with paying $35 a day. And I said, $35 a day. That's like a thousand dollars a month. Um, he, he's never going to be making money off of YouTube at that level. You can make money off of YouTube still. If you get a sponsor, like somebody that you advertise for, like you see this on these channels anymore. This, 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 it's because the advertising on uh, AdSense is on YouTube doesn't pay anymore. And it pays like half penny. Uh, for, I mean, you might make a penny for a thousand views, right? It's ridiculous. But the only, the only way an advertiser is going to hook onto your YouTube channel is if you're only on one topic. And that's not Andy Lee Graham. I wanted to talk about the world. And the minute you change countries, you're on a different topic. People will sponsor you. You see a lot of the uh, oh, whoremonger websites in Thailand and Philippines and stuff like that. And you got all these digital nomads that are only in Thailand and Philippines. They're criminals, okay? <laughs> They're not to be trusted. But the digital nomads really only go where the internet's really good. The cost of living's really cheap. And then they try to get these, the four hour work week with Tim Ferriss is kind of what gave us Spurge. I, I was a digital nomad way before him. And, but he learned by going to Europe on a vacation that he could reduce the amount of time he worked if he was more efficient. And, he, you know, he never, the four hour work week was just a, a clickbait topic, okay. But he did uh, create a generation of people that wanted to get, um, Freelancers from abroad. So I, I've always had somebody working. I, I've only had like a couple Americans, but we probably had, I don't know, 400 different freelancers. We used Upwork a lot. I still use Upwork. Um, really difficult to deal with these guys because most of them are techies and these techies are, they don't have any morals. Okay. And uh, they, they've learned that American and a lot of the people are, are dumb. And Upwork tries to allow the Indian, Philippine, Ukraine workers and Russian and Eastern Europe people to, uh, what they try to do is they try to get a, like one third of American wages, even though their, their daily wage in Ukraine would only be say $20. They'll try to get a $50 job that only takes them an hour to do. And this is where they are doing. So they're always in gouch mode. They're not in residual work every day. I had gotten Andrew by going to India and being in Palom Beach and walking around the internet cafes and saying I need a PHP worker. And I'm a guy named Brett Conrad worked for me, worked with me for about two or three years as a PHP worker from the United States, a friend of mine. And he, he unfortunately died. He was an excellent, excellent person, a first rate Thing. Uh, most of India is uh, India and all these techies at Upwork. They're not very moral, okay, and they don't really care about people. All they care about is money, and that's pretty normal in any business. But it's really tough to deal with because um, the internet's all about tempting. You, you see these pop-up ads and all these things. These are you see I get on Forbes.com and there's so many pop-up ads. Uh, you can't get away from them. The pop at, up ads is to get you to accidentally click on the wrong thing. Now they have native advertising, which is it looks like a it looks like a article, and you click on it, and it's really an advertisement. Uh, Instagram, Facebook are full of native advertising. Everything single thing you're clicking on looks like one of your best friends is writing you. Interesting stuff. But uh, 
how to make money on the internet remotely, the ideal way is to be a graphics person. If you can be very, very good at graphics and you're artistic, uh, you can pretty much write your ticket, I think. Because graphics people, I've hired hundreds of them, only one in, I don't know, 50 or 100 is actually any good at all, okay? Uh, but you can get a job working for a graphics company in America, and they they need the, the, the artistic skills. Like, I probably could get a job as a thing. I, I don't want to go to that level. It's a lot of work to do great graphics. It takes a lot of skills and a lot of, you know, study. And But the ideal way would be to go to the United States or Canada or Europe or whatever, one of the 25 overdeveloped countries and get a job working in a graphics company that does printing and stuff. And then work with them for about six months a year until you have, they have you using, they're using you in a way that they're good. And then you can go remotely. The problem with working remote is time zones, okay? I always remember big Kevin in uh, Sosua Dominican Republic. I said, why don't you go live in Thailand? It's like full of women. And he goes, Andy, I want to watch football during the day. I don't want to watch it in the middle of the night. <laughs> and this is a big deal because if you're going to teach English online, which is another great way, right now the internet's fast enough, you can teach English. The way the normal expat makes money, probably 50% start bars, and the other 50% start aid organizations, which are really just businesses. So a non-governmental organization is a business. And... Uh, this thing see this all woven together. Teaching English is a probably a reputable way to make money and working as a graphics person with a company in the United States. Now you understand though they can fire you in a second, right? And they really should pay you about half of what they do there. Because if they don't control you, you know, you, you gotta work out a relationship where they're paying you almost per graphic as opposed to time. Because time People don't work when they're working independently. Like Andrew, my partner, he always thought that he worked a lot, but he was really thinking about working, okay? And he had the greatest life for 20 years, okay? But um, I could talk all day about remote workers. We used to have a thing in remote working where we had a chat with uh, Yahoo groups, and you could have this, or Google, and you could have this ongoing chat with them, kind of like WhatsApp. And we could see when they were online. And the only way to control their time was to watch if they were online. Now, nobody wanted to be online, including me or Andrew. And But um, when somebody charges you with Upwork online, it's, it's just a waste of money, okay? You always get them to bid by the job. I'm a very, probably an expert at creating um, workers on Upwork because I know how they think and I know their methodology on how they want to make money. They want to get paid a set fee and then they, they're going to act like it's going to take them four hours and they do it in one hour. A really good worker is, doesn't, it doesn't really matter how you get it done. You want to get it done at a very good job and you want to make, uh, you kind of need follow up too. You need to develop a relationship uh, with somebody on Upwork. It's very tough. Better way to do it. We used to apply for, have we put some advertisements in India until we just decided. My Indian partner decided that Indian workers were not to be trusted. He's kind of funny. But we used to put advertisements in the Indian Mumbai newspaper to get people. And that worked pretty good. And it used to be we could use Google AdWords and buy advertisements until they went. AdWords went from about $10 a, 10 cents a click up to about $1.50 a click. Even for India, it's ridiculous how Google has bent people over the table. I mean, they are really, really out of control. But uh, internet advertising doesn't pay really. Very, very, doesn't pay good unless you have a person that is working full time and you have a business big enough that it can, uh, it's like a very good way to get enough traffic to start a business and enough members and then you can spin them. But really what you want is on any kind of website is you want referral. And whether it's any kind of viral growth is thing. But uh, everybody that calls themselves a digital nomad really is like somebody says, oh, Andy, you should go to Argentina. They got this thing, visa thing for digital nomads. I said, nomad guy, nomad. 
nomad means I want to go anywhere I want to go. I don't want to go to Argentina just because you give me a tax break. I could care less. I cup yours. It's too stupid. I want to be a digital nomad. And I have gone to 114 countries. I go anywhere I want to. And I made money for almost 25 years. So I'm really one of the world's longest perpetual travelers, perpetual nomads, and I actually live. But the secret is, is that I've always, I've never had my ego involved where um, I had to, I don't know, do things that make people happy. I didn't try to live in hotels or, see like uh, a lot of these, like Gabriel, whatever, these guys will, make a lot of money by lying about a hotel. So when a travel writer's talking, they're lying. Anybody that's a New York Times, they're all liars. They get free rooms in, in exchange for uh, writing nice things about a thing. About the only critic I know that's maybe honest are food critics. Um, anybody that's a travel writer, they normally are just a paid prostitute that, that they can. I haven't only taken them two, maybe five rooms in my whole 25 years. I got a lecture by about 10 of the biggest. They said, Andy, you should never pay for airfare. And I said, I do not want to have to lie. <laughs> I guess I, I always think about it. I could never be a radio announcer because I'm not going to talk about some product that I don't agree with. But, uh, but what that does make me come across is, is arrogant. Why? Because I don't know anybody, and I'm not going to kiss anybody's butt to be a travel writer. I'm a travel journalist, and uh, but I'm an honest one. The hard part is the advertising model doesn't really work. It no longer works. You cannot get enough clicks to really make money by telling the truth. You get most of the models now are all clickbaits, or they're advertising. You know, a husband and wife, girlfriend, boyfriend can do pretty good as a traveler because that's. That's appealing to like 80% of the people. I never, I tried to get my girlfriend last year to realize that if she would join me, she was like watching this tangerine travel and she said, hey, you should be like tangerine travel. Well, get on the videos with me. Well, you know, everybody's got, uh, they're wanted by the law or unwanted by the law. 85% uh, of expats are probably hate the United States. The other 15% of expats are probably wanted by the law. There's like a 5% or they're on Social Security disability. Uh, but uh, I could talk all day on Digital Nomad. It'd be better if somebody interviewed me about it because I've done it for 25 years and I forget what I did, right? Very, very simple now. Extremely simple. I have found out that one trick thing is that I have two smartphones. I never really break my smartphones. So I got the, the best smartphone I ever had was a Nia Mi X, whatever. It's a Ukraine phone. It's much better than the United States uh, than Samsung. Um, but Samsung's a good phone. Apple's for people that live in the United States. Apple's for people that live in the United States. Apple's for people that live in the United States. They're really not a global product. <laughs> okay, uh, They are a very high status and I, I was telling a guy yesterday, I said, if you want to get laid by a girl, tell him you got an Apple smartphone because uh, going to 114 countries is about a zero. Traveling scares people. So the idea of going to 114 countries scares them 114 times. Okay, being a digital nomad is 99% of these guys are not nomadically traveling and they're just using it as a moniker that sounds good. Uh, working remote is probably, or location independent. I like that term. That is what I've done is location independent. I'm independent of the brick and mortars. We've never had a brick and mortar location. I had a guy say, Andy, you need to get a, this lady said, you need to get an office. And I said, why? So I, so you can go to the office. I said, you don't get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm free. Okay, I'm Andy Lee Graham. I've traveled nonstop. I've been to 114 countries. I've lived in 114 countries in 25 years and 10 months. January, in March, it'll be 26 years. I, I'm grateful to the good gods, and I'm grateful to my family, my mother, and my friends, and everybody that's been supportive. I have now have, I'm going to a, uh, an economic model where I'm going to write books because I don't really have to compete with Amazon on those things. Um, 
I don't want to sell products online. I don't want to sell SEO services. I don't even want to try to be, see, YouTube or Rumble or any of these things, the advertising model works best if you only stay on one subject. And we're just not one subject people. Travel is all the subjects on the planet, but ten, it's living life at 10 times faster because all the experience that you have, I have, I have five times more of them because I keep moving around and I keep moving the mix of people. Okay, I hope that makes a lot of sense. I had a lot of fun trying to explain it, but remember having that Mavic camera it cost me $700 and I put these little three and a half inch floppies in it. The book that I, uh, I was laughing when I made this book. I got it. I wrote this book. This is where I went to in uncontacted travel. But mo a lot of these photos were taken with my Mavic camera. <laughs> I'm laughing. Hey, here's what I looked like uh, in Shayla when I was in 1994. Looked kind of young, right? Muy guapo. I took a picture. This is a this is a book you can buy. And it's it's uh, about 30 photos that you'll never see in your life. Like everybody goes to Babylon, Iraq. Everybody goes to live in a yurt in Mongolia. Everybody's seen a sadhu in Hopi, India. Everybody goes to see uncontracted tribe. Everybody has that woman walk up to their hotel in Benin. But I'm here and you're not, why not? It's all about emotional management. Travel is not really a money problem. It's not an earning problem. It's about having the mental, physical, spiritual, emotional group under control. I'm calling myself the PhD of travel because philosophy of Henry David travel. Henry David has the absolute perfect self-reliance way of looking at the world. And he is the best model on how to deal emotionally with society so that you don't get enmeshed and hooked. I mean, when somebody starts talking angry about the United States, I go, it's one of the best countries on the planet. I said, I love the passport. I, 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 anybody can become a millionaire there. Anybody is free. It's one of the least racist places on the planet. On the other side is it's out of control with inflation, and whatever. And it's uh, mathematically going to become Spanish. Did you know that the American, uh, the American white Caucasians probably have about 1.7 kids. We're not even replacing the children we, we think. And the Mexicans are having, say, 2.5. Islamics are having three. That means that mathematically, the white population is going to disappear from the planet. I was telling this guy, Jeff, the other day, I said, I don't care how many people come across the border. Just open the border and make them all legal. Okay, this idea of having a country with no rule of law, where nobody has respect for the law, is what a third world country like Guatemala and Peru and Mexico, they all have, nobody has respect for the law. Nobody obeys the law. Just look at them driving. That's how the United States is going to be in five or 10 years. Okay, bye-bye. Life is good.